Hello and welcome to the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association's Reasonable Doubt. My name is Murray Newman. I am the current president of HCCLA and I am your host tonight. With me is my treasurer extraordinaire, Justin Harris. I'm your only treasurer. <laughs> well, that makes you extraordinary. I am very unextraordinary. <laughs> and you keep signing up to do it again. Uh, yeah. I mean, long time. You know, it's like the hot potato game, right? Damon Parrish admitted to being a member of the math club a while back. Were you a member of the math club? No, buddy? I'm like the worst person to be the treasurer, but I don't think they realized that before they. It's a pain in the bean counter. Like, it's a it's a pain in the butt job, but you do a great job. I just count the beans like four times. I'm like, okay, I think it's sixteen. Yeah. All right, and we have a special guest tonight. We have one of three, uh, one of our distinguished. Lifetime Achievement Award winners uh, with HCCLA this year, Mr. Danny Easterling, former president of HCCLA and an icon of the, the CJC. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time. Uh, it's good to be back in the studio. I, I remember doing a lot of these shows. It, it's a great little forum to get our word out. So you were saying before the show that you were president in 99. 1999, 2000. And what were the pressing issues of oh, the day during? It was a huge issue. We were moving into the Criminal Justice Center for the first time, All right. a brand new construction. It was a huge transition for everybody, uh, both sides of the bar and the judges too. There was quite a bit of build up to it, um, how we were gonna organize the building, um, there was a lot of collaboration with the Houston Bar Association and the criminal law section. It was more active back then. Um, and we had to get, um, we had to lean on everybody to get a trial ready room on the seventh floor. Oh. Cause they didn't, they didn't want that uh, necessarily. And we, we had to push for that, we finally got it. I'm glad we did cause that, that served us well for a long time. And j just the move was pretty major move now that uh, the, the cramped, yeah. the cramped uh, courthouse across the street. And uh, that was an interesting time. So that was 25 years ago, because I started as a prosecutor in August of 1999. So I started yeah. during your presidency. And, um, and, and I had a very small overlap back when 301 San Jacinto was the main courthouse, right? And uh, and everybody was. I remember because we. I was only there for a couple of months before we made that move. We made it pretty quickly, and um, and everybody was really excited about that. It was pretty exciting uh, because, you know, your your office building, of course, was antiquated, old, cramped. Uh, I remember going over there and visiting uh, Pick Up Discovery or something and then walking over people in boxes. And <laughs> At 201 Fannin, yeah. Yeah. That's and the building uh, they just tore down. That was, yeah, that was the That's DA's right. office. That's correct, it just got tore down not too long ago. And of course, uh, the old courthouse was so, uh, so old and so crowded and we need to make we needed to make the move, obviously. We did, but you know, it had a lot of character though. You had some very humongous courtrooms that were really stately, like Judge McSpadden's and Judge Poe's. Their courtrooms were just beautiful. Oh yeah. And and we we lost some character in that move on on it. But uh but you know, when you get prime real estate right there on the swamp, I mean you gotta you gotta yeah, take I mean, it. build it right on a bio with you know, don't elevate the first floor. I mean, the architects and the design in, did a great job. Yeah, we were there for almost a year before we had to move I was out. Say, one you year, move right back yeah. out. Yeah, yeah one year, and then comes the flood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, was HCCLA and when you say that we had to fight real hard to get that attorney ready room, or the trial ready room, did you, were you did y'all have to approach the county people? The county people, did HCCLA have a, as they say, a seat at the proverbial table back then? Well, I made sure we had some sort of seat. I was talking, let's put it that way. I mean, okay. I, yes, there were meetings uh, with building, facility building management, uh, whatever their name is. Um, a lot of meetings with them. HBA got, again, like I say, with us, meeting with the judges, meeting with whoever we could meet with. Uh, I don't think we actually had to go to commissioner's court, but, uh, they came around because we kept telling them, look, the, 
The civil courthouse has had one forever with the trial lawyers over there. Mm -hmm. We're trial lawyers too. We, we need one too. Right. And, um, but back to the old courthouse, if I may. Uh, sure. Because this is, this is a night kind of to reminisce, I guess, since I'm, I've been doing this a long time. But the honor you're man. right about the character of the old courthouse. The, yeah. the basement cafeteria was legendary. Sure. Uh, I can remember many, many times uh, after court going and drinking coffee and telling the wool story, talking with Racehorse Haynes. Uh, he was in there a lot. He liked to drink coffee and talk with other lawyers, particularly young lawyers like me. Uh, he was a good mentor to us. And uh, to receive this award is very humbling. I'm very grateful for it uh, and anything associated with the award with his name on it, it's pretty special. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, one of the things that I think is, is lost on so many people is that, is that that building, we really got to rub elbows with celebrities in our field. And I don't know, I mean, maybe, maybe it's just a Houston thing, but I mean, I don't know that, you know, all due respect to, to Dallas and, and Austin, some of these other ones, that anybody had the name brand defense attorneys that, that Houston has historically had, starting with Percy Foreman and Racehorse Haynes. Absolutely. Uh, I was fortunate. Uh, my father was a lawyer. He had a downtown office, 806 Main. And I can remember uh, going to his office, particularly in the summer, and uh, when I was in high school, even junior high too, but mainly high school. And he would encourage me, you know, go watch the good lawyers. Go over to the courts and watch them. When they're in trial, go watch them. And I did. I, I remember watching Rachel Sainz in trial. I remember watching Percy Foreman in trial. Percy Foreman was incredible. Wow. Both of them were incredible. But he was, had the booming voice. He controlled the courtroom. I mean, nobody was stopping him. When, when would this have been? Let's see. I graduated high school. 73 so we're probably talking 70 okay 71 72 in there during the summertime yeah and Percy was still going and um, I think most of us at one point ran into racehorse Haynes if you've been practicing for 10 years you saw him around oh, the court yeah. but but Percy Foreman was gone before a lot of us so he was a big guy right oh he's huge he was tall commanding oh yeah absolutely and, uh, and apparently just one of those people that uh, if a thought entered his mind, it went right out his mouth. <laughs> we know a lot of people like that, <laughs> that now. And of course, Dick DeGaron. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, same thing. He told me to watch Dick. Once Dick left um, Percy, started out on his own, he did a lot of good work real quick. He got into a lot of trials. Okay. And then... Uh, once, once we moved into 1018 Preston, where I was like 30 plus years, Dick was one floor above us, which was very convenient. We were on the sixth floor. He was still on the seventh floor. He's still there, and we we both joked it. We paid enough rent to own the building now. Uh, after 30 all these years, years, you have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but him and Lewis Dixon were great lawyers, of course, and I used to go up and talk with them, bounce things off of them. It was. It was so convenient yeah. to be that close to those guys. Uh, so those were pretty interesting times, to say the least. Well, and you know, and as many name brand defense attorneys as have come out of there, like like Racehorse Haynes and Perch Forms and, and Dick, there, there's also a fleet of others that probably the general public doesn't know. That, you know, that they're probably some of the most unsung, amazingly talented lawyers that, that work there that are, a lot of times, they're their progeny of, of, of some of these mm -hmm. lawyers. Yeah, it's been said many times that the Harris County Criminal Defense Bar is, is the best bar down in Texas, for sure, you know, maybe even the nation. I mean, we, we've, just, we've just developed so many good defense lawyers here. Uh, and I don't know the exact reason why, uh, but obviously we're the fourth largest city in the country, that tells you something, but yeah, we've had a, a good long list, and I had Christina, our executive director and uh, awesome person. Uh, I had her print out for us three guys. We went to uh, Tyrone Moncrief is the other one, and of course uh, Casey Kernan is the other one. And let me just say, 
Uh, I'm proud to go in with two other fellow lawyers that are fantastic lawyers and great men. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to go in with those two guys. We've been doing three people for the uh, for this particular award of lifetime achievement since 2016. Before that, we used to just do one a year, but then we started figuring out, hey man, we're getting old. We, maybe we <laughs> maybe we ought to start doing speed it up more. Yeah. While I thought still we weren't going to tell anybody why we were doing three now, Danny. <laughs> But uh, I, I've got to let We have off. a robust, amazing defense bar of yeah. people who have dedicated their lives to defending people accused of crimes by the government in Harris County. And so you're right. We had to step up the number of people we were honoring for this. The, to get the Lifetime Achievement Award, Murray, what is it? You have to have 35 years of practice dedicated to criminal defense at least. At least. I and, you know, so, yeah. I've... So what's the list? I'm at 43 years, and in November I'm just hitting 44. So. Wow. But you got to hear some of these names. I mean, to be in the company of these names is just, it's its staggering how, how good all of these guys are. Listen to some of these guys since 2002, is how far back as we can go, but Victor Blaine, uh, Bob Bennett, Andrew Jefferson, Mike Ramsey, Dick DeGaron, Don Lambright, David Byers, Bill Habern, Jim Stafford, George Parnum, Jack Zimmerman, Stan Snyder. And then in 2016, we started doing three uh, each year. And the awesome list goes on. Uh, Robert Pelton, Catherine Scardino, Max Secrest, mm -hmm. Alan Isabel, Robert Alton Jones, Clyde Williams, Sam Adamo, Skip Cornelius, God bless his soul. And I want to talk about him uh, All right, tonight. Yeah. Connie Williams, Mike DeGaren, Terry Geyser, Randy Schaefer, Wend Wendell Holdem, Odom, excuse me, Paul Schiffer, Craig Washington, what, what a legend, mm -hmm. Wayne Hill, Wendy Pastorini, Gus Saper, last year, Ed Millett, Jerry Patchen, and Ollie Heat. So man, I'm honored to be in the company of those Giant men and women, because there's some giants in there, there's no question. Well, you know, I could say that is a very distinguished list, but during my time as a prosecutor out of that entire list, only one of those people ever beat me in trial, and that's this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he always reminds me of that. I, I do, because, you know, when you're a prosecutor, it, it absolutely escapes you how much the evidence is on your side. <laughs> right. You get very accustomed to the idea of winning and you let yourself believe it's because you're amazingly talented. Sure. And sure. then uh, and the funniest thing that I will ever that I will always remember about that trial is I'd known Danny for years. I was a felony too when we tried this case against each other. I thought he's the nicest guy in the world. And then I tried this case against him and I realized he was not. Not, <laughs> <laughs> not in trial. And I was like that guy's mean. <laughs> what happened? We're and, in a courtroom now. Yeah, and he changed know, colors or it, something. Well, and the thing was <laughs> that this was not like a case where like it was some trash case I had to try. I thought I was going to win that case and mm. I was I was disabused of that notion quickly. Very quickly. By Danny, but I couldn't believe how mean he was. <laughs> that trial. Like on those cross examinations, like you'd have some poor cop who'd like said, you know, like I, I think I arrived at five o'clock and he'd be like, yeah, the offense report says you arrived at 4.45. You got any more lies you want to tell the jury? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, it is rough up there. And, uh, That's a trial and, warrior. Woo, yeah. <laughs> it, it was scarred. I needed to like talk to a therapist after trying. I, I remember the trial. It was a oh, sexual, sexual assault of a trial of a child. Yeah. I remember the client. It was a neighbor, right? And there, I remember phone records played in there as well. Yes, at some yes. Point. They, were, they were neighbors and... Uh, I, I always remember uh, Murray's, uh, I think that was, uh, you know, the, the advent, so long ago, the advent of PowerPoint, maybe, you know, yeah, no, first uh, starting yeah. to use it, you know, hell, yeah, I was in the dark ages, man, I had paper, <laughs> but uh, he had this big PowerPoint, why lie, oh, yeah. you know, that was his theme. Of why the would a child song. lie? They why could lie? never do that. <laughs> <laughs> and. Fortunately, we had some motives why she lied, and the jury saw that. Uh, 
And I think that's one of the most successful defenses you have in one of these child sexual things is if you have motive for the, mm -hmm. sure. for the there, if there's underlying drama somewhere. And there was drama in this one. They, they knew each other and then there was, I think there was some sort of uh, bribe attempt because they knew my guy had money and yeah. they mm -hmm. didn't. Uh, there was a bribe attempt that we got in evidence and that it started kind of unraveling for the state. <laughs> oh, it did. It, it did. But for, you mean for Murray? You be, you be, you yeah, Murray. yeah. Let's you just be, call it what it was. It was, <laughs> it was, a, it was a butt beating fair and square on that one. So, but, um, but no. How long so, was the jury out? Oh, I can't remember that. No, oh, no, too long ago. I figured I was waiting for uh, like, 17 minutes. It, no, it, it, 17 it, it, minutes. It was, long long to be told it was no. neither extraordinarily long or extraordinarily yeah, gotcha. short. Gotcha. Yeah, medium two or three range. Hours, yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, you know, I always marvel that a jury can agree on what they want for lunch, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> let alone on something as big as that. But you, I mean, you've got to have a million war stories, uh, you know, after oh, what, 43 Ooh. going on 44 years. There's a lot. How many? Not guilty by reason of insanities have you gotten? I know of one. That's more than that. I no, think three. Three. I think three. And I've been uh, told I probably will never see one in my career. Most lawyers never do. And you've gotten three. They are a rare bird. Um, the one that sticks out the most that I always will remember, of course, is uh, a young man, uh, seriously paranoid schizophrenic, Long history of it, in and out of treatment, non-compliant with his medication. When he was on medication, he was okay. When he was off, he was psychotic. He was just, would decompensate quickly. And he was living with his elderly dad and, um, and it went south. He got off his medication. Uh, what was so unique about the case is, is there was a 911 call when it was happening. Hmm. Uh, the dad called 911 and just basically laid out the case for the jury. He's like, my son, he's, he's mental, he's sick, and he's, he's going crazy. He's crazy. Uh, and you got to get over here. He, he's probably going to kill me. It was just chilling, you know, but it was so accurate. Uh, and sure enough, he got stabbed in the chest by my guy. When he was in full-blown psychotic delusions, he thought that you know somebody was trying to kill him or something. And classic paranoid schizophrenia. And um, we had a good expert, a psychiatrist, forensic psychiatrist. They had your typical psychologist from the Harris County Jail, the forensic unit, mm -hmm. uh, who just kind of winged it, that, oh, he knew what he was doing. But there was a standoff. I mean, after that 911 call, of course, they rushed there. Then there's this standoff, oh, excuse me, because he wouldn't come out. And then they hear a shotgun blast. He's, after he kills his dad, he shoots the shotgun blast into a, a, a sofa. So now we've got the SWAT team out there, you know. SWAT team stand out for two or three hours. He comes out the back. They set up in a barn. This is kind of a semi-rural area up in the North Houston area. They set up in a barn because they had horses. Mm -hmm. These guys had horses. They a sniper oh, wow. with an assault rifle set up in the barn on the back door. He comes out the back door with a shotgun, waving it around, and there were some patrol officers over here, and that guy shot to kill. He shot him three times. Wow. Mm -hmm. Once here, an arm, and once here, and he survived the wow. shot. They had an ambulance there, yeah, ready to go. They knew something bad was going to happen. Rushing to Ben Tov, and by some miracle, he survived. He pull, pulled through. Uh, yeah. And so uh, this was a time, too, for the longest time, there's a statute on the books that say you can't, you're not supposed to be able to tell the jury what happens to a defendant when they're acquitted by reason of insanity. It's still there. Yeah, it's still there. However, I think judges are coming around that, that the juries need to know. Absolutely. Uh, because if they don't know, they think they acquit him. He's just going to walk out on the street, right. kill and again. It's, it's yeah. a not guilty verdict where you don't get freedom. 
No. Tell, tell the you're going to about that. Well, well, what happens is, is you're committed to a state hospital, which is what it, the way it ought to be, because you're ill. Right. Uh, and you, the two prongs of a insanity defense in Texas are that you have a severe mental disease, which was easy in this case because mm -hmm. nobody could contest that. It's the second one that's usually hotly contested. Right. It's the second prong is is that you're so severely mentally ill that you don't know your conduct is wrong. At the time you at do the, it. At the time. Yeah. At the precise moment that you stab or shoot or kill the person or whatever your conduct is. And so that's usually hotly contested. But we had, again, we had a good expert and the jury did the right thing. We also had an interesting thing. He had a, a big family. He had numerous brothers and sisters and they were pretty supportive. Two of the siblings, two sisters testified uh, in support of him. Hmm. He needs help, you know, he needs help. He doesn't need to go to prison. We're sorry this happened, but we see why it happened. We saw it building. We warned our dad that this is not a good thing. You need, need to get him some help. Don't don't let him stay there with you kind of thing. And, and the jury, of course, uh, really listened to that carefully. You usually don't have that. So yeah. that's happening during the guilt innocence. Phase. It is. During so that's guilt. normally there is mitigation no punishment. evidence. There is no punishment. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Right. So, exactly. <clears throat> so you have to set this all I up. I had to set it up carefully. Started. Yeah, I had to set it up, obviously. And to get it admissible, you got to do it the right way. It was, it was a little bit uh, tricky in a way to, that's the wrong word. It was a little bit uh, unusual, but you, the judge was a good judge uh, that let us try our case. And I, I can't remember who the judge is right now. It's been so long ago, but I think. It's the one you tried with Wade Smith, right? Yes, I think Wade was on that one. Yeah, he was the second chair, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, I'm getting like text message after text message from people who are just going on and on about how Danny's the best. This is a great show. So but they just yeah, want you to. They I'm want you to talk that more in the comments on our. Oh, more war stories. I don't know. Well, but you know the, the but you know the thing is about the, the those cases because I tried to uh, not uh, I uh, self defense uh, excuse me insanity defense once and did not succeed because juries typically I think are resistant to them. Oh, they, yeah. they see it on TV that like oh we're going to claim temporary insanity and they yeah. think it's just it's some so sort of cute. parlor trick. Right. They are suspicious of it. There, there's no doubt. They. Uh, I think that's been shaped over the years by media a lot. Sure. Um, before you proceed to trial on that, you have to let the court know that that's mm -hmm. going to be your plea, oh, yeah. right? You in know, writing, that... you have to give them notice of the insanity defense within a certain number of days, right. I think 20 days. It's so then you code. can voir dire on that. Oh, oh, yeah. you have, oh, you yeah. have to. You to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, yeah, it's I'm, like, just, I'm trying to remind oh, yeah. the audience the board of the lawyers. Oh, the, the trial is completely different. You are yeah, falling right. on the sword. I mean, yes, during board it, hour, but... this is not a question about who did it or whether there was a murder. I'm telling you right now, folks, that there was a murder and my he client did it. Did it. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and you know. And the question is, is what was going on in his mind at the time this happened? And then you board out a lot of mental illness. And you say that to the jury. Oh, what you, you just have said. to. Yeah. I mean, well, you got to be up front with them and let them know this is not a whodunit case. All right. right. <laughs> and, you know, in, in my experience on those cases, too, when you're dealing with something where, where mental illness is in play, usually the crime is really gruesome because oh, they're so out of right. control. Yeah. Yep. So it's not just your one shot you know, and move on. It's yeah. usually a really nasty, nasty scene that is terrifying. Oh, this right. one was a big butcher knife, you know, right in the right in the chest, right in the heart here, and he, he was laying in his bedroom with the knife still there. You know, yeah. it, it was it was gory. And to hear his voice on the nine one one. Oh, it was got to be just yeah, terrifying. Chilly. Oh yeah, when the when I first played that for the family, they were just in tears, you know. You know, but but to talk about that, I think, and this I've kind of got a transition. I'm I'm thinking okay. ahead here. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think though that that the Andrea Yates case has probably done more for for understanding actually how that works. And I think you can actually kind of use that in a way to kind of backdoor slide in, letting a jury I think panel you're know. Absolutely right. Does anybody know about that case? Where is Andrea Yates right now, folks? Yeah. He's in a state mental hospital. Anybody run into her at the grocery yeah, store? Yeah. And she's never getting out. 
Right. Okay. Uh, and I, I think I remember bringing up Hink, John Hinckley. You know. Yeah. He was in state hospital forever. Mm -hmm. uh, I just try to get people thinking of examples of when um, this has been found. Yeah. This has been successful. Yeah. So you can do it too. Right. Exactly. And uh, trying, obviously, trying to talk to jurors about mental illness can be difficult because it's an emotional subject. And some people will tell you about the, my daughter has it or my cousin has it or, and uh, you gotta get them talking and get the other jurors to understand that it's not their fault, that right. their brain is organically damaged some way, some, sometimes even from birth. I mean, uh, it's, it's a sad situation when somebody's brain doesn't work right like that and goes completely off the rails and uh, it's just, but it's a certain percentage of, of our population has, has mental illness. I mean, it's just, it's a high percentage. It's a high percentage. And in the criminal justice system, the stats are, are incredibly high. Uh, people who are charged with crimes, I don't know, Sometimes it's 30 or 40 percent have some sort of mental illness. Uh, if it might even be higher. Than I think that. it's higher. Well, we always hear that stat that the Harris County Jail is the biggest mental health provider yeah. in the in state. The of state. Texas. And, Absolutely. Uh, and that's that's huge, and it also speaks to yeah. a lot of what we deal with. And and what a lot of people also don't realize is is that there are degrees. You know, I I mean I I make kind of the the gallows humor joke every once in a while that my client's crazy, but not cl crazy enough to help himself, you right. know, because you can deal with people who are profoundly mentally ill, but it's that, as you pointed out, it's that kicker of that they didn't know the difference between right from wrong. Right. And that, I, I remember watching Lynn McClellan for Dyer on it during the Resendez trial, and he said, and the way from the state's perspective that he was woodshedding these these jurors was saying that you know that basically the actor would commit this crime right in front of a police officer right because they just don't know any different and it's like once you think about that it's like who on earth because that was a big deal with Andrea Yates you know that they argued against insanity because apparently she had planned on killing those children earlier but uh, I think her husband's brother had come by and so she didn't do it because she knew he'd stop her. Right. And so they uh, they said, well, there you go. She knew what she was doing was wrong. And um, and I, I think that you would probably agree with me on this. I think you both would. But that, you know, the reality is, is that that statue needs to be softened a little bit in, into what counts for insanity. True. And um, a lot of times, the state's experts, the forensic psychologists, or if they happen to get a psychiatrist, they focus too much on what happens afterwards, mm -hmm. like where they're trying to hide something, like hide something or they're trying to clean up the blood, or, or they hide property, they hide the murder weapon, or they do something like that. They try to seize upon something like that, but there, there are alternative explanations where somebody's still in a in a delusional uh, psychotic state, they can still do things like that and still don't understand what they're doing. Right. And still not know that it's, it's wrong to hide evidence. Or, uh, I had another case where a, uh, a lady killed her father also, and she just walked around the body in the kitchen, just laying on the kitchen floor for 24 hours. She never called 911. She just kind of went on like, like everything was normal because she was in a psychotic state and didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And that case was one uh, on body cameras hmm. because somebody called a, a welfare check, like a neighbor, I think, because they saw her outside walking around talking to herself and they hadn't seen her father out or anything, they say, oh, we better get some deputy out, and a deputy comes out, and, and she's just totally incoherent. Yeah. About 24 hours after she had killed him, she's totally incoherent, and that was powerful evidence to show her state of mind uh, that she didn't know what she was doing. On, on the one that I had, a uh, guy who had long, long documentation of, of mental health issues. He just wakes up in the middle of the night, kills his girlfriend because he thinks that she's letting bad people into their hotel room. Mm -hmm. But he like puts the couch pillows over her in like the most pathetic yeah. type of 
thing and then he leaves and they're like, oh, well, see, he was trying to cover his Covering tracks. It's right. like, uh, like you sure. consider, it, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good job. A couple of pillows, yeah. no right. one's gonna that notice really that. really worked. Ignore Dead the body. body. What right. kind of hotel was this actually? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, so what, I think I might have cut you off earlier, but what, and I apologize, what was the jury, what's the rule? Tell the audience the rule that the judges can't do. I guess you said that, they can't tell them what's gonna happen and then did something go differently in one of these trials where the, ju the judge did let them know or you're just saying that you think that that should start happening? The judge did let me bore dire on it. Okay. And the state was objecting, but I, I don't know, I think, th that statute needs to be changed. One hundred percent. No question about it. It's to be just changed. it makes no sense, and I don't know why it was ever drafted and approved by the legislature in the first place. And because I think there's more people would jurors would exercise. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's That's definitely it's definitely probably jurors are let people go with murder left that, and right. Yeah, if they district can attorneys just, are probably the ones that supported that and moved it through the ledge. But I think that the judges are uh, there's a trend to let the juries know. And so it did come out, fortunately, and I think it helped a lot for the jury to understand. And, and I, th I think the way I set the seed in the voir dire was is bringing up prior examples, John Hinckley and- Oh, that's- other What, what happened, happened in that where case? Where are they? Okay? okay, and where are they now? Okay, okay, why are they there now? Because well, it's the law. Well, don't ask about Hinckley yeah. now, yeah. I think he's out. Yeah, I think he got out now. At the time he wasn't. Uh, and who was the other one? Um, who was Hinckley? Who was the yeah, one that he, killed John Lennon? Well, he no, he 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 pled, he, uh, but that was Mark David right. Chapman. No, he, okay, he's, okay, he was he's serving his. But sentence. there was another one. I forget right now who it is. But there's some examples you can bring up uh, where the the jurors will understand and remember. Um, well, speaking speaking of old cases, this is the transition that I had. Bill okay. asked. Yeah. We, we you know. Uh, OJ died today. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't. Saw he, I, I saw something that, that he was in Houston. I don't know if he was at MD Anderson or what. He died in Houston. I, that's what I saw. Oh, I didn't like, hear I, that. I, I didn't hear somebody that. posted that on Twitter, so it must be true. Well, they yeah. said uh, cancer, so it's, 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 it could yeah, be that he was at MD I'm Anderson. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, Justin and I are a little younger than you, Danny. So you were, but you were a practicing defense oh, yeah. attorney when when OJ. I watched uh, a lot of it on TV. And you know, as as much as people got wrapped up into the debate, I think I was in college. I think I was a senior in college when this went down. But you know, as much as as we got uh, bogged down in the in the facts of the case and people debating it, it changed the the national perception of the criminal justice system. And I'd love to hear your perspective on that as a practicing defense attorney at the time. Well, I can remember I, I would, uh, you know, go to court in the morning if I wasn't in trial, do my normal dockets, and then we had a TV in the office. And I I was trying to remember what year it was. They told, uh, it was told us in 95. Yeah. Uh, the and, verdict, right? Yeah, the verdict was in 19 trials. So we're talking 24, 20, 29, almost 30 years ago. Yeah. Well, the, I, I believe I, that. The, the, Bron the Bronco right. chase was in the middle of the Rockets yeah. in the finals. That's, they right. Kept That's, That's right. That's right. Yeah, they kept That's right, because they were back to back in 94, 95. Yeah. That's why I was like, why do I remember the, Bron the Bronco chase? But yeah, it was, but yeah it I remember watching the verdict too. Uh, what was so unusual is, of course, California. Sure. California proceeded. That trial went on for months yeah. and months. I mean, it was incredible how long Can you and dragged out it was. I mean, and of course, all the judges here in Harris County are like, I can't believe they're dragging that thing out that long out there in it California. Was insane. It's it was insane. the longest trial you've had. Phew. The capital. Well, if you if capital, if you count Vordire, with a death penalty, yeah. you count Vordire, then you're talking two months. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one time it it took a month to pick the jury. They took a little break, and we're still preparing, and then it took another three weeks or so. Right. So that was a couple a couple of months. But so. nothing like the O.J. Simpson trial. No, I mean, yeah. how many months was it? It was I at mean, least like, nine. It was like it was nine, nine months. I th and Can I think it that? took the place of the Manson yeah. trial as the longest. That case here yeah. would have been. 
three weeks top. Right. The, the, three the weeks. breaks they were taking, top. it'd be oh, like, oh, yeah. Like, did you put up the crime scene tape? All right, ladies and gentlemen, okay, we'll, we'll, see see <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. And, and the, the bench bar conferences of, of the bench were just like, go on for hours. <laughs> you know, that would not have happened here. You know, they Who set that pace, do you think? Did the prosecution, the judge, or the defense? Oh, the I defense think running the circles around. Uh, right I, I talk to the people. That's the way they try cases in California. They they just they do the slow roll. I mean, and the judges are fine with it. I I guess can so. imagine the juries are. Although, oh I mean, yeah. Well, they, they were sequestered the whole oh, time. Oh, that's right. They were. Oh, yeah, yeah that's that miserable. So, yeah. That case had everything though. I mean. Uh, it had, that was when DNA was fairly new. Oh, it was uh, brand fairly, new. Brand, and fairly new and brand new. And uh, they, they created a lot of doubt about the DNA testing. And then the, the detective turned out to be- Furman, Mark yeah, Furman. Mark yeah. Furman turned out to Dropped be the, probably a racist. And, yeah. And not the best detective in the world. Well, they used him, it was him, right? They were saying it was like tainting the blood Oh, yeah, yeah, for the DNA. And yeah. Like, yeah, the defense team. OK job. had a hell of a team, man. Yeah. He had lots of good lawyers, and they did their job. I mean, they raised enough doubt with the jury, and that's, I mean, a lot of people complained that, oh, he got away with murder, and they didn't get his work. Well, they weren't sitting there listening to the evidence. Right. You know? Did you know? Uh, they weren't in that courtroom. Like they did. 12 jurors were. What, somebody did a mini series, and I don't remember which network they did it. The, but when they did it, you, even if you didn't agree with the verdict, you understood, understood how they got good, to how they and, got there, and and you're like, well, that makes a lot. Yeah. It's not such an alien moment uh, if you actually watch it, you know, because they're on the heels of Rodney King, right? You know, and and it's just a different atmosphere of oh, distrust yeah. and and um, it, and just a lot of screw ups too. Yeah. Oh, there's the lots of screw ups and just it seems like every turn of the state's case, something was going wrong for them. And uh, it was, the lawyers did a good job on cross examination, bringing all that to light. I mean, and then of course, what the general public is seeing is a totally different thing. They're seeing all of the legal commentaries and, and the news reports and which you only get snippets of it, right? You don't right. get the full but, story. But suddenly, but with Court TV, you were getting to see the whole yeah, trial. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, to me, the thing that was so interesting is, I mean, Court TV had been around. I think their biggest case before that, that they profiled had been the Menendez brothers. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. But OJ, the OJ trial just blew the doors oh, off it of that. It became, did. it became entertainment. Yeah. It absolutely and, was entertainment. And I was I, in high school and they, I don't know if they took us out of class, but they at least came over the loudspeaker and told us the verdict. Wow. wow. In high school. And um, yeah, my, my father had, it was an artist when he was living and he had a studio at the house. And 1995 was a tense year for my parents because my dad, as weird as this is, if you knew my dad, this was very weird. He watched every single minute of that whole trial. Oh, wow. yeah. He didn't yeah. paint one thing that year. That's a marathon. Serious man. problems with that. But yeah, he watched a every marathon. day of that trial. Woo. Well, and you know, and I was, I was well, he wasn't I got, alone. I gotta ask this then, what, what did he think about the verdict? I think, did he have an opinion about I it? I think he thinks OJ killed Nicole and Ron Goldman, but I think that he thinks the jury's verdict was understandable. Because they, was, firm they had reasonable they, doubt and yeah. they could, didn't prove it. Yeah. Right. That's to say, did, yeah, everybody needs to understand, who's not a lawyer out there, is that, that you know, the state always has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. If there's any reasonable doubt whatsoever in their mind, they have to follow the law if they follow their oath. And find them And guilty. give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And find them not guilty. That has to happen for our system to work. They each it swear to, to do that. They swear to do it, and you have to remind them of that over and over again in final argument that you're just doing your job and following the law, and your verdict will be res respected. I, you know, I saw some commentary on on the Facebook pages of, of, of I think of TCDLA and and on on HCCLA and some, some and maybe the Texas Lawyers Lounge, some of these Facebook groups that talk, that are lawyers, and someone said that they didn't think you know the murders aside that nothing did more damage to the criminal justice system itself than the trial. And uh, and what do you think about that? Do you agree or disagree with that statement? I think there was a lot of fallout for domestic violence cases. Yeah. I think there was a big shift 
with the prosecution of all domestic violence cases, not necessarily murders, but family violence, period, uh, which there's thousands of assault family member cases where it's just bodily injury, where you're slapped or punched or beat. For many years before that, if the complainant, who was generally a girlfriend, wife, if they didn't want to prosecute, they want to drop the charges, the DA didn't care either, um, they dismissed the case. Um, but then I think when OJ happened, there was a big shift. There was, they started developing family, family law divisions and mm -hmm. domestic violence divisions. And they started looking at the cases differently. They prosecuted whether the victim wanted yeah, to. Yeah, we're going to look at the evidence. We're going to look at 911 calls. We're going to look at photographs. We're going to see if there's medical evidence. Uh, and if she, if she, the complainant's not here, we're, we're going to go forward on some of these cases. Uh, and I think that's because OJ. I think, if I'm not mistaken, there were some there were some signs that oh there were yeah, there were no, some definite, were definite signs that their relationship was not going well and that he wasn't the nicest guy in the world. Yeah, no, they no, I, and I always I always thought that too was kind yeah. of the pivot point when it came to the way district attorney's offices handled it. I wasn't a prosecutor at the time, but I was working at the right. DA's office up in Brazos County, and and these non-prosecution affidavits suddenly didn't mean anything. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but no, they had those pictures of Nicole Brown Simpson beat up pretty badly. Yeah, black from eyes and stuff. Yeah. And, yep. and, and, oh. and you know, but I, but kind of going back to what I was talking about a little bit earlier. But I, I think that to me that was when criminal law became entertainment to a lot of people, and and I don't think that's ever changed. And I, I remember when I was a kid, I, was all, I grew up across the street from the elected district attorney in my town and I was fascinated by crime and everybody kind of thought of me as like a weirdo, <laughs> you know, and, they, and maybe it wasn't just that, but, but the crime uh, geek but, over uh, there. But all of a sudden, everybody was a crime geek. And now, yeah. you know, they now, now today they have like crime con, which is like, so many which times. is like comic palooza for Nancy Grace. And, and, you know, it's amazing how many, how much money people now try to make off of crime that it's it's just i to me it just changed the whole game it put court tv oh, on the map absolutely and, uh, documentaries uh, my wife good evening i know you're watching she watches them all the time uh kelly Seeger show she watches those uh what cold justice cold justice yeah, yeah. cold justice uh, heard of it yeah, yeah there's you? there's uh -huh. lots of them yeah, no, and it, it's amazing to me. And, you know, because I remember I was working for the DA's office when the OJ trial was going on, and every time that we would, that we, we had to serve subpoenas as part of my job back then, and any time we, if we caught somebody at home, they were watching the OJ trial. Yeah. <laughs> it was on. We could go from house to house, like, who's on the stand now? Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. he's still oh, on? Oh. Okay. So. Did he answer that question yeah. yet? Yeah. Uh. Like, you're not going to believe this. Did he bring out the glove and put it on yet? <laughs> and you know, oh, it doesn't fit. Guys, it doesn't fit. Quick. <laughs> you know, and, and when I was in law school, uh, Johnny Cochran uh, did a book signing um, over at that bookstore. It's right there on uh, like Wesleyan and, and Bissonette and, and, you know, a bunch of my law school buddies and I went. Murder by it, the book. Murder by the book. Murder no, by the book. No, and now it was uh, There's another Brazos, Brazos, Brazos yeah. bookstore. Yeah, yeah. Brazos. There you go. Brazos yeah, bookstore. Yeah, yeah. Right. You just said Brazos. Are you chip tripping me up here? But yeah. yeah. No, well, that's, where, that's my home county. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> But uh, man, that guy was charismatic. So I, I, oh. have, I have an autograph book. He's so nice. nice. It's like we told him we were law students, and he was so nice to us. Little oh, he used to come and yeah. talk at Rusty Duncan seminars and things like that after after the verdict. Really? Yeah. yeah he he became pretty dang popular. So did his yeah. firm. <laughs> I think that's speaking of Johnny Cochran and his firm. I think that that's one thing that the trial did is this whole concept of a dream team. Yeah. Right. Sure. You know, and it's. Yeah. I think it's still something I find myself like trying to emulate or oh, yeah. when I'm, when I'm yeah. getting for a trial, let's see who's going to be the right one for this and that, yeah. you know. And Barry Sheck was the DNA guy. Right, right, you right. Know? And then um, F. Lee Bailey. F. Lee actually, Bailey was know. on that. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, but a lot the, of the irony here, I was, I was kind of joking around in court today. I was like, most of his dream team is dead. And he outlived yeah. them by long. But oh, what does yeah. that say about our careers? Yeah, Barry, <laughs> yeah. Barry's the only one that's alive, I think. 
Yeah, when you talk about mental health and the race, it's like defendants or defense attorneys. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah. I think Shapiro's still alive. Oh, yeah, Robert Shapiro Spurs. might still be alive. You're right. I forgot about him. But uh, Shapiro and Johnny Cochran were kind of the lead guys, I guess. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they were L.A. for sure. Uh, but yeah, that that was uh, quite a trial. Was it something you said it, people kind of talked about around the courthouse and the judges couldn't uh, see how long it was taking? Oh, well, everybody couldn't, but you know, for sure, some of the judges like, I can't believe that that judge is allowing this to go on and they're wasting so much time. You know? Was there any flurry of, maybe not a flurry, were there any dismissals of some murder cases after that verdict? The DA was like, ooh. I don't, rec I don't, I don't recall that kind of reaction. There was I, a lot of DNA training that went on. I bet, yes, yeah. I think the DNA, uh, they saw the problems in that trial with some of the DNA procedures and, and the testing in the labs. And uh, I think that there was probably a, a pretty big uptick in training and uh, as well as trying to solidify the, you know, the veracity of DNA, that, that it really can work the right way, it really can be a scientifically uh, valid way to test things. Uh, but it just it took some time, for sure. But uh, yeah, I, I, I can remember watching the verdict some afternoon there in my office and going, dang, yeah, that's interesting, to say the least, because you never know what what a jury's thinking about no. it, you know, because they're isolated over there and they're, nobody can talk to them, nobody can get a feel from them. Of course, that's that's happened my entire career, you know, you always wonder, well, this case looks pretty good to me, but I don't know what 12 strangers off the street right, right. are thinking about this, you know. And uh, you have to advise your clients a lot of times in that way, look, you know, these jurors coming in, they're not like you generally, okay? They're they're law and order people and they've never been arrested before and they are taxpayers. Uh, they see violence on the TV all the time. They see it on the, the nightly news and they get jaded and they, they're they tired of it, uh, which they have a right to be tired of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have to, we have to fight that a lot of times uh, during jury trials, as y'all know. And it is what it is. I think OJ also added a level of expectation of jurors to be entertained uh, yeah. to, to, to some degree as well. Because I remember, you know, being tangentially involved, you know, in, in the system back then. But like we started doing the big foam boards and taking an eight by 10 color photo and we right. called them the OJ boards, you know. OJ the, boards. The, the <laughs> OJ boards to print for, to present the big, you know, like here's, you know, here are the stab wounds and you'd have like, you know, six or seven eight by 10s all on the same piece of Demonstrative exhibit. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think jury really came oh, to, yeah. to expect it. To, and I think that a lot of showmanship became more prevalent because of that. I think absolutely so. They, they spent millions of dollars for that kind of stuff oh, on yeah. both sides. Yeah. All those exhibits and uh, the experts that were paid in that case it was tremendous. And then in all those trials where they use those big oversized exhibits and they get admitted as evidence, the court reporters, somebody has to store that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what, we just build some buildings with all those big old OJ They're boards? Right. Yeah. Like, I, I bet that court reporter stayed very busy in that trial. But not just that one, but all the other ones where those uh, OJ boards became popular. Oh yeah, that too. Well, they that, did those expansions not, in the CJC, I wonder if they found some like hidden, hidden in the walls. Well, you know, Channel 2 does that, the evidence room, and they where they've got all those old right. exhibits going back to Carla Faye I, Tucker I and before, and I mean, you wow. know, and it's just huge warehouses yeah. that, that, that they, that they be, keep uh, up. I remember trying a murder case once where a, like a 50 pound like cement <laughs> slab was uh, was excavated. Was, it was part of it. Like somebody had chunked it through a window, which had, you know. Deadly weapon. Well, it, 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 <laughs> that had been the motive for the murder once that. Oh, went, they, oh okay. Came there right we go. So it wasn't the murder weapon, but it was definitely it part of it. It provoked some bad and, stuff. and I remember getting out that exhibit sticker and the court reporter looking at me like, don't you, uh -uh, don't you better give me a photograph, <laughs> Murray. <laughs> uh, everybody's like, who, that was the hot potato for who was going to get that sucker. But, um, so, Did you admit it? 
No. Well, I can't remember. <laughs> I think I actually sent it back to the SO and they were pretty mad that I did that. So, yeah. <laughs> I had to get so, a, so, Danny, had I, to get... I, so I'm curious, you know, because you brought up the point earlier in saying that I was the I was PowerPoint guy and you were still paper guy. <laughs> have, have, what technological advances would would rookie Danny Easterling be stunned by how you try cases now? Oh, good I think, question. Dylan. Yeah, I, I think that uh, come a long way. I mean, I, I can remember in the old courthouse. You know, there was no emo. There was there was no big screen TV. If you were lucky, on a DWI case, they would roll in a TV with a VCR machine and yeah, play it. Yeah, <laughs> I'd have to kick it and knock it a couple of times, get it to work, and play a video, a grainy looking poor video of a, of a traffic stop in the field sobriety test, but uh, yeah, there's been a lot of advances, of course. Uh, yeah, there's... But have you uh, embraced, have you embraced uh, it? Pretty much, pretty much. It took me quite a while. Uh, heck, I remember it took me quite a while to get a computer. I mean, yeah. come on. Uh, there was, I, I've been around that long. But yeah, the, everything's PowerPoint now. I, and I've heard many speakers over the years, particularly the last 10, 15, 20 years, that jurors, uh, I mean, everything's visual with them. I mean, with phones and laptops and iPads and big screen TVs, I mean, they want to see and hear things, you know, and they want to see the visuals. Yeah. Uh, they want to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they want to embrace that. And so you, you've got to do those things. You've got to have your exhibits. You've got to have your PowerPoints now, I think, to compete. Uh, the state always has uh, lots of PowerPoints in yeah. the trials I, I have had with them. They, they definitely have a PowerPoint during jury selection. Uh, they definitely have a, they'll have, uh, a pretty interesting, either a big poster board of timeline of events, uh, and then they always summarize it with a, a PowerPoint on their final argument, where they bring out all the high, all the most incriminating things, sure. you know, the, of their themes of their case. So, yeah, there's been lots of changes, and you got to roll with it. Um, you know, I was on a panel that uh, Brendan Dunn was the defense attorney on, and and he he was. He, had a, he was taking notes on an iPad, but he didn't use PowerPoint. And he really connected a lot better than the state did I using do, the PowerPoint. I can't do PowerPoint. I, I, I'm, way. I super rely on it. And uh, I had to, I'm, I'm rethinking it because there's so many points that I think I'm going to forget if I don't put them, commit to it. I'll have an outline. I have yeah. an iPad. We use technology, but I, I, I don't want anything between me and the jury. I don't want them looking at anybody but me. My, my first. That's, that's uh, a good, that, that can be good. I mean, We'll, we'll for, see. For certain gonna, there, there are cases that I have used PowerPoints yeah. for. My first closings are where it's very effective for me because I can show the jury what I want. But That's right. My, That's right. my first jury trial as a prosecutor in 1999, we had a chalkboard. In my first trial, yeah, a lot, I I, I'm trying a uh, public lewdness <laughs> again, uh, where the defendant is a very <laughs> wagger. Is a no. This is a very attractive. Oh, okay. Uh, very attractive dancer who has violated the sexually oriented business stuff. And so I'm writing stuff up on on this chalkboard. I start having an allergic reaction. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm doing an <laughs> and I'm like crying. I'm like, and so anyway, <laughs> she sat in that poor officer's lap. And, and so I welcome electronic stuff because I'm not allergic. You're not allergic to, to the, the electrons. <laughs> that jury was out about three minutes before they found her not guilty. Oh. That, was my, that was my welcome to, to Harris. County. Did you know you were allergic to chalk? I, I, do, I have horrible Damn. handwriting. I tried to avoid publicly writing anything in the first place, but I mean, <laughs> you know, I, this is what you were going to do. And, Maybe and, you lost it because your handwriting's so bad. No, what I lost it was because I didn't know that when the defense attorney, uh, who was Mary Simon, uh, nice. struck the th only three women on the panel and put six men <laughs> oh, yeah. to, uh, to try this gorgeous... <laughs> they, you didn't have a reverse-backed Batson objection? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Like, and I was talking to my chief, like, I think I got a chance, and he's like, you don't. No, not no, anymore. You're going to lose. Not anymore. I was eternally optimistic. Yeah, uh, that officer was very offended <laughs> by that conduct. Yeah, yeah <laughs> the, uh, they, they were out for five minutes, and they think they filled out the forms where they could donate their service, <laughs> right. their, their, their jury money to that. <laughs> yeah, proud moments in uh, litigation history there. Uh, so, all right, so we've got... Um, 
Danny, one of the things that I wanted to thank you for, uh, because we got two minutes um, in addition to everything you do for your clients, the stuff you do for, for HCCLA, yeah. um, you have been our legislative liaison for how many years now? A lot. Um, been a while. Going in and, and devoting your time to keeping track of the, the Senate bills, the House bills, the laws that we need to be worried about. Um, that has that a, been a priceless service that you have done. You have, you have been a president that, that went on to stay very active in this organization. And, um, and I've, I've really enjoyed working with you the past year. I can't thank you enough for what you do on, on our Well, behalf. I appreciate that. I've always uh, had HECLA in my blood. I mean, it's a fantastic association and I've, I've really enjoyed being active in it because I think our mission statement is extremely important for what we do. And you've had a very good year, Murray. I want to thank you for being a great president. I mean, you're Appreciate coming it. coming to the end soon. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we were supposed to have our final meeting today, and it got punted. I'm yes, like, it I'm got punted the next yeah. week. One more week. Well, One more week. I can I can remember, and most presidents say, I'm going to be glad when I have that passed in front of the word president. Right. It, <laughs> it, it's like having a second full time job. I it's, mean, it's why you get paid the big bucks that, for it. That, you know? That's right. Ah, I write all that's the high paying job. Paid. That's right. <laughs> but. We're yes, down to one minute. To echo so. what, okay. what Marie said. Um, this has been recognized by the organization. You were, like you said, president in 1999. You were lawyer of the year in 2003, HECLA Leadership Award in 2013, and in 2019, HECLA recognized you as the mentor of the year for the organization. So, and you were one of my mentors under the Gideon's Promise and the FACT program. That's so correct. And we you also. And you Absolutely. also, you come in with some great company and we're going to get them on the show hopefully in the next couple of episodes. I hope you do. Casey and two Tyrone. great guys, man. We're, we're starting in alphabetical order, so. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Well, I'll watch if you get them on because uh, they're great guys, man. They're great guys. They're You're really deserving of the award. It's an all-star class that, that we're bringing in. Well, you know, it's a Hall of Fame in my opinion. I mean, I, I that's the way I'm looking at it, and that's what Casey and Tyrone and I talk about. It's it's our Hall of Fame, and we're very proud to be a part of it. Well, congratulations. You're, you give us something to aspire much. to. Thank you very All much. All right. Well, it's been a very fast episode as always. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Justin, for being here. Thank you, guys. And thank you all for tuning in, and we will see you soon. All right.